And I know they appreciate your prayers. But, you know, this is what it's about. It's about training young people. Uh, you've invested in her life and, and Kyle's uh, church that he's from. Uh, they've invested in his life. And then as you invest in their lives, you train them up and then send them out and just see what God uh, you know, wants to do in their life and how he wants to use them. Um, so we'll let you know a little bit. We're going to kind of wing it a little bit tonight with our service. We'll have a song. I'm not sure how long the kids are kind of practicing. And then they're going to come up and sing for us here in a few minutes. And then they're going to stay up here for the presentation as we have our, uh, they're going to show their presentation there to Liberia. And then after that, when it gets over to the preaching, Elizabeth will take them down with a couple of our uh, female workers. They'll go down and with the kids and they'll have a class down there uh, while uh, we're getting preached to up here. So anyway, that's kind of what's going on here for this evening. Um, now this week we have our uh, Saturday morning, we have our men's prayer breakfast. That's at 8 o'clock. So men, if you would make a note of that, uh, we want to be in prayer for uh, Cold Wars. And uh, that's coming up here. And then uh, Farmer Sunday is coming up, our Old Fashioned Farmer Sunday. Uh, so if you want to wear some old-fashioned garb this Sunday, that'd be great. And then we're also going to have our, uh, since we're going to have a meal after our morning service, uh, we're going to have uh, our evening service will be moved up to the afternoon. So right around 1.30, uh, 2 o'clock, we'll have that. And uh, so we'll move that evening service up. And there is a sign-up sheet in the vestibule if you plan to be here for the meal. I know that would... Uh, be helpful as far as letting us know the total number of people who will be here. Uh, we do have, we want to honor our farmers though this Sunday, so we'll recognize them. If you could ahead of time, if you can let me know, um, I like to have a sheet of paper just so I can say, hey, here are our farmers. We may have a few visitors that are farmers, but what I'd like you to do is be able to tell, here's what we do on our farm, and there's a lot of different things people do with their farm. Uh, you know, so we just want to honor you, recognize you, and I think that's an important thing because it's not quite the way Joe Biden said it was, where you just take some seed and throw it in the ground and then you know, there it goes. It's a little bit more involved than that. You know, uh, farming is a little bit more complicated. That's why there are people with master's degrees and things in that particular area because it's a lot, uh, a lot of work, and we appreciate all the work that goes into it. Uh, now, Cold War is coming up here June 12. We have that. Uh, the Beams will be here with us, and uh, they'll be our guests there for the week, and we're excited to see them again. Uh, he'll be preaching here at our services. And then, uh, of course, the dates in there also for team camp uh, and junior camp are in the bulletin as well. Now, there are a couple fundraiser things that are coming up. Uh, there's a fundraiser for uh, the Ballard Cemetery. That will be coming up here in a few weeks. Uh, also, uh, the young man that I announced here a couple weeks ago, uh, the sheet is in the vestibule there. Uh, they are asking, I think it's June 10th, if I remember correct, on the dates. Uh, they're just asking for just different people to make some desserts uh, to help out there with some expenses that he's had. And that will be, if you can help out with the desserts, I think they go to uh, Linside uh, United Methods. I think it's where they're having it. But it's on the sheet back there. Uh, you can look up that information there as well. Um, now I did get an update here from Andrea. She did hear from the insurance adjuster. Uh, so, and this of course is an immediate concern here for our church, but for Andrea and Arnold, uh, of course her house was a total loss. The adjuster was surprised that they didn't sell her more insurance than what they did. Uh, she really didn't have insurance to cover much of anything. So uh, they just suggested they just bulldoze the house and and then they'll just have to start from the ground up and just go from there. Uh, so it's really, there's not going to be really any financial help. They're just going to kind of wait and see what happens. And uh, so if you know some programs here in our community or around the community who uh, help out with things like that, we can you know, definitely check into that. We definitely want to be praying in that way. Uh, as far as labor right now, she said really there's not much labor. I think they're going to bulldoze the house because everything is pretty much a loss. They got out of it what they could, uh, but then I think they're going to have the fire department come out and have a control burn and just burn all that down. They're going to save anything they can, um, but it's just not going to be much. So 
and then they'll actually lay a foundation. They didn't have a foundation in this house, and that was part of the problem, uh, how it created the draft you know, for the fire to go, and it just took off from there. So anyway, they're going to be able to build up from ground up uh, from that point. So we'll just kind of see. Uh, she's going to keep me informed with anything that we can do uh, from that, you know, for that, but we definitely are going to need to do something uh, we can help, you know, financially help other things. You can help with labor uh, as far as getting materials, other things like that. Just kind of help them along and just praying, you know, let God lead us. And we uh, we want to be a blessing to them. And, uh, you know, I, I believe with all my heart, God's got a plan and purpose for it all. We may not understand it. Uh, obviously, they'll, they're, she's discouraged. I know they're, we're all discouraged. Uh, but we just need to trust the Lord, you know, through this. And this is kind of a... We've had some folks in our church go through fires before. It's never, ever an easy thing, um, but it's a lot different, you know, when you don't have the insurance to cover a complete loss or, you know, something else. So we just need to be praying, pray for wisdom, pray for direction, and uh, and just go from there and let God lead us. So I appreciate those of you who have already started doing some things and. Uh, there are, uh, there is, I think, at least one or two fundraiser things out there. We have the Quilt uh, that Courtney is doing, and I think there was another one uh, that I heard of. So anyway, there are some things out there, and we'll try to keep you posted with more as we go along. So anyway, that's kind of all of our announcements right now. I think I hear the kids out there. So uh, we're going to go ahead and do this. Let's stand. Let's welcome one another to our service. We'll uh, take up our... Uh, Wednesday night offering, and then I'll let them know they can come in and get ready to sing here in just a few minutes. services tonight. Uh, God, would you help each one of us to be attentive to what you'd ask us to do tonight. And God, we just ask it all to your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Maybe see
sure we've got a couple of calls here for you. I don't think they're listening out here. Yep. They have to get songs for us. And then if I forget, please remind me after they're done and after we see our slide presentation, we're going to have a time for question and answers uh, before, for how to listen, before the young people go down. So I think they have some questions and things as well.
some pews here, and then we'll have our yeah, presentation. And then there'll be a question and answer time here. And then after that, you so what we'll do is after uh, the question and answer time, we'll do a congregational and that'll give them time to head out uh, as we're singing and we'll go to there and get into the preaching. So anyway, this is the presentation. After the presentation, Kyle, if you want to come up and kind of explain that you and Elizabeth can answer some questions that they have. Uh, the kids, I think, have a few questions. The adults may have some as well. And then we'll go, we'll have a song, and then go into the preaching, and she'll take the kids together for class. I don't think it'll help a whole lot, but if you turn the lights out, it might help. Okay, it does help a little bit. Let me get these lights over here. The Republic of Liberia is located along the coastline of West Africa, bordering Sierra Leone, Guinea, and the Ivory Coast. The country spans 43,000 square miles, roughly the same size as the state of Tennessee, and is home to an estimated 3.4 million people. Liberia is Africa's first and oldest republic. It was established on land purchased from indigenous Africans who were freed slaves by the American Colonization Society in 1821. Although Liberia truly has the potential to be a flourishing tropical paradise, its history is quite tragic. Social and ethnic divides plagued the country from the beginning, with a political minority of free American slaves segregating and oppressing the indigenous Africans. These failed political policies were determined by what ultimately Violence. From 1989 until 2003, a series of ruthless civil wars killed over a quarter of a million people, while thousands more were displaced, mutilated, and tortured, often by armies of drug child soldiers led by competing war groups. There are even widespread reports of modern candidates. Ten years later, the 2014-2016 Ebola crisis mainly affected Liberia, killing more than 11,300 people. All of these factors have left most Liberians poor and homeless, struggling to support their day-to-day existence in a culture that places a very low value on human life. There is no shortage of opportunities for outreach in Liberia. Our main goal is the planting of indigenous churches in the rural regions of Liberia, pushing the gospel and the indigenous dialects into unreached areas through the use of various ministries, evangelistic outreach, personal discipleship, and children's ministries will all play a vital part in rescuing souls from the culture of death with the gospel of life in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Just before her fifth birthday, 
At the age of 12, she surrendered to the Lord to do whatever he had for her to do. The language barrier dramatically increases outside of the capital city of Nairobi, and the majority of the population of the interior counties of Liberia cannot be effectively reached by the English speaker alone. To add to this difficulty, travel through the interior regions is difficult, strenuous, and sometimes simply impossible. Because of this, the majority of missions outreaches are localized in the capital and other industrialized areas. Recent advances in road structure and technology in the country are changing this type of opening doors that were previously closed. Cell and internet services are rapidly becoming available all throughout the country, allowing an indigenous gospel voice to penetrate to places that were up until now all but a region. We will seek to utilize internet radio, apps, podcasts, pre-recorded devices, and possibly even FM radio to accomplish this goal. Partnering with godly Liberian men with the heart for their country to help carry their indigenous forces even further into the darkness. There are several ways that you can help us accomplish God's will in these endeavors. First of all, you can pray. Ephesians 6 18 through 19 reads, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me that others may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Please pray for us as we seek to spread the gospel. <laughs> Second, you can send. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15 asks us, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Please consider partnering with us by helping to send us to Liberia as we seek to pursue God's calling on our lives. Third, you can go. In Acts 1 we find the words of Jesus, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. God has a place for you to witness for him, whether it's across the sea, across the country, or across the street. Help God's people reach the world with the gospel by telling someone about Jesus today. <coughs> Yea, so that I strive to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, but as it is written, to whom he was spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Start by thanking you guys for having us out here this evening. And the privilege of being with you. I love the Masters Club presentation. I did Masters Club until I was so old they kicked me out of the program. And uh, the kind of funny thing is there's still be there'll still be times uh, where there'll be a conversation I'm having with somebody or a sermon or something and a verse that I memorized during Masters Clubs and haven't looked at since will just, you know, it'll come to the surface. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I love the choice of songs. Now, when we first started Deputation, uh, my wife was like, we got to go do something with the kids. What are we going to do? And I was like, well, we can sing that missionary song about eating bugs. And uh, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't remember the rest of the song. All I remember was, uh, you don't need a skillet, chew it until you kill it. So uh, that's, uh, that shows you the kind of person that I am. But that's, that's, a great, that's a great song right there. Appreciated that. Um, I'm supposed to do some answers and some questions and answer time. Y'all can ask questions. Hopefully I can have some answers, it's a, that's an undecided part. Um, I'll go ahead and start with one, because whenever we do this, nobody ever wants to go first. So I'll give you the first question, I'll answer that, while you guys you know, work up the nerves to ask you to know, raise your hand and all that good stuff. But uh, most people want to know, what is deputation? And uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, deputation is where the missionary uh, travels around from church to church trying to raise some support uh, so they can go live on the field and serve the Lord for the time there. You know, many pastors, uh, they are, you know, they're paid to do what they do. They get a salary from the church. Uh, in the foreign field, that's just not possible. Uh, on top of that, in most countries, as an American citizen, you're not allowed to work a job and get paid. 
so even if I wanted to go work a job and start churches at the same time in Liberia, I could not do that. And uh, so we would go from church to church, raising a little bit of money here, a little bit of money there, a little bit of money over here from different churches that want to partner with us and being able to spread the gospel there in Liberia. So that does normally take some time, uh, generally anywhere between two and three years. We're obviously praying that the Lord will help that to happen in a shorter amount of time as opposed to a longer amount of time. Uh, but there, so I asked the first question, I answered the first question. Uh, so does anybody else have any other questions? Is it going to be about food? It can be about bugs? It can be about whatever? Any questions? Wow, you have the smartest church in all of West Virginia because they already know everything. Okay, yes, ma'am. Do you speak the language or do you take a translator? Well, uh, that is a very good question. So I uh, almost wish to give everybody a round of applause. For <laughs> Anyways, well, the, the language uh, would be considered to be English. Uh, now, that is a common trade language. Uh, so it's taught in the cities. Uh, there's, there's maybe, basically, everywhere you go, you'll be able to find somebody that can speak a little bit of English. But if I were to bring a Liberian in here right now, he would not understand any of what we are saying. And y'all would not understand any of what he was saying either. So as an American, if you go over there to preach and they're actually serious about hearing what, actually knowing what you're saying as opposed to just, you know, getting the gawk at the foreigner for an hour and a half, uh, they will want you to be interpreted. Um, so one of the specific goals that the Lord has placed on our hearts uh, is we would like to be able to learn enough of at least one or two of the top dialects in order to communicate in that language. So the burden the Lord's put on my heart is to try to reach uh, certain areas of Liberia that are relatively unreached right now because of a lot of the difficulties with travel. You know, the places that some of these people are at, the people that come out, they don't ever go back. And because there's no money involved in those areas, a lot of, uh, a lot of unfortunately, a lot of people that are there, you know, doing the work of the Lord, they won't go out there because there's nothing for them there. So in order to reach those places, we're hoping the Lord will be able to give us some grace and strength to learn those languages. So y'all pray for us because my wife loves that kind of thing. Me, uh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer when it comes down to anything, let alone learning languages. Uh, so that is that is an area of, uh, for prayer there. So did that answer the question? You know what? Okay. There's 16 different dialects, by the way, that they speak. Uh, you normally find someone who speaks one of one or three. Yes, sir. What about the uh, cost of living and stuff like that? The cost of living. Well, in the capital city, it's actually surprisingly high, although actually very comical uh, compared to living here. Uh, you could probably find a, uh, an apartment for 800 to 900 a month in the capital city, but you might have running water and your sewage is going to stop up four or five times a week and you'll have electricity you know, maybe three hours of the, out of the day. Um, so it's actually very expensive inside the capital city and that's where we will probably be at least for our first term. Uh, it's the easiest place to move into. Uh, but outside of that, it does drop pretty, it does drop pretty dramatically. So. Do they have electric and stuff in the outer areas? Uh, it, 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 it depends. Uh, there, there's projects that are underway to bring in power from the Ivory Coast. I don't know if we'll live to see that day. Um, but there is, there is, you know, the, their government is actually more corrupt than ours when it comes down to those things. So it, it may be a lot. But, uh, you know, so there's some places where there's, where there's power. Uh, the capital city has power provided by the government. But... It goes out, you know, quite quite regularly. So you, outside of the capital city, not really just have your own generator and run it a few hours a day, and, and you know. So. Is that a traditional shirt? This is a traditional dress shirt. Uh, so yes, now some people say, hey, that looks a lot more comfortable than the suit and tie. I can assure you, it is not. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but yes. Uh, they're very difficult to get in and out of. My wife has to, I can get into it. My wife has to help me out of it. And it's, that's, that's the one with the zippers. And not all of them have zippers. So uh, it's, it's, it's something else. But yeah, it's quite different, isn't it? And one guy told me he had one from Walmart or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I saw some hands in the back there. Yes, ma'am. How long is a term? 
How long is a term? Now that is a good question, and by that I mean it's a difficult one. Uh, it used to be the traditional idea of the term was four years. You're gone for four years. You come back for a whole year. Uh, you know, and before that, travel was even less doable, and so it'd be six to eight years. It's kind of just something that it kind of depends on how it falls out for you individually these days. Um, some, some missionaries will do, they'll be gone for two years, and they'll come back for six months, be gone for two years. That seems like a little much to me, uh, so I'm not exactly sure what that will look like. Uh, the traditional model right now is four years and one year back, but if you're in a West African country, you kind of don't want to leave your churches unattended for a whole year. Uh, so it kind of just comes on a case-by-case -case basis. But, uh, there's another hand back there as well. Yes, sir. Some of us out there that you had already you've been down there three times already. Yes, yes, sir. What did you say the last time you were down there? What, what was it that you were doing? Well, my last year in college, actually, um, my best friend uh, was the president of Missions Prayer Band. That's a group of students on campus that just uh, try to pray more about missions. And then every year we do a John and Romans project. And uh, I had been to Liberia the year before, and he had been to Liberia the year, uh, well, I'd been two years before, he'd been one year before. And I said, hey, how about we just see if we can do our own John and Romans project and send those to Liberia. And so make a long story short, the Lord allowed that to happen, and uh, we were able to send those over to, to a uh, missionary of like faith practice. And then the last time that we went, that was last summer, August and September, I was able to take my wife for the first time. And uh, we worked with that missionary and his church, and we passed out 23,000 John and Romans in the capital city in four and a half hours. That was actually quite astounding because you have government leaders that will stop, and they will ask you for more of them because they want to give them to their coworkers. So, you know, that stuff doesn't happen in places like that doesn't happen around here. Okay, so there is a lot of open doors uh, in Liberia to spread the gospel, and uh, so that was what we did that last trip. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Do you have any roads? Have any roads? Yes, there are some roads. And uh, there's a lot of roads that are being built, but a lot of them are just mud. Uh, it's kind of funny. The stuff that guys pay big money to go uh, make, their, make their trucks able to deal with, these guys do day in and day out is a way of life. It's a lot of fun. Lots of mud. You like playing in mud? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. You know, so there's some roads, but more, more mud than there is roads. In fact, it's not uncommon during the wet season to see entire tractor trailers. It's a different tractor trailer than what we have, but a tractor trailer sunk up past the cab in mud. That thing will be there for months until it, you know eventually they get that sucker out. So uh, well, I'll come back over there. Yes, sir. Um. um Hey, I love to play in mud. Uh, I love to play in mud too. It's awesome, yes, sir. Even pigs. How open is the government to you coming in and being a Oh, right now the government is is, is fine with that. Um, would you would you say that? Would you say that? Right now the government is fine. Yeah. Is it like a very oppressive area for you guys to be working in? Front of people no, or or? That, that kind of depends on, on, on where you're at. It's a very, very landscape in that, in that regard. And uh, we will definitely, we will be starting in the capital city. Uh, but where it's exactly to move from there, I, I couldn't, I mean, I could make up a plan and give it to you, you know, just to say that I have one. Um, you know, but there's, there's going to be some, you know, things we'll have to figure out when we're, when we're on, on the field here. That would be the honest answer. Would be the honest answer. <laughs> yes, sir. You, uh, you said rent would be like eight hundred dollar up. Uh, what is the ratio of their value of money to U.S. Oh, uh, uh, the would first. You, would the, you be paying in U.S. money as well? Yes, uh, you can pay in U.S. and U.S. money. That most places will accept the U.S. dollar. In fact, they would rather take the U.S. dollar. Worth more than their money. Uh, I think what was the last the last time was what six hundred thirty five Liberian dollars to one U U S dollar. Uh, so there's actually a country out there that has worse inflation than we do, wow. believe it or not. Uh, but yeah, so we uh, the first missions trip I was on, uh, we went to Liberia. We changed American money on the street. 
when he walked back with these giant duffel bags just stuffed full of Liberian dollars. It was, it was like, man, they took a picture of it. It's like, this is the closest thing to being a drug dealer I've ever met. <laughs> There's a picture out there somewhere of me and my brother sitting around a table and he had changed all of his, he had gathered like change, uh, selling stuff in the dorm to buy an engagement ring. And so he had turned in all his quarters and pennies and dimes from that into one dollar bills. And so there's a picture of me and him sitting around a table, you know, holding guns with sunglasses and a, t a table piled full of money. It was all once. You know, there was even more of that. And it, was, it, was, it was great. So it was a hundred cents. One dollar is like 635 pieces of paper in the Liberian dollar. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, in your presentation, you had something about the cell phones and yes. uh, data and all that stuff going on. So, is your phones for the wealthy only, or is that everybody has them now, and are they expanded away from the main cities, too? Yes, excellent question. Uh, when I first got there on League of Legends, it was like eight years ago. When was that, 2018? So it wasn't quite eight years ago, almost. Yeah, and just, just, just in that short period of time, everybody has phones now. And uh, they'll have two or three of them. Uh, because actually that phone is not worth, you know, a tenth of the price that you pay for it. Uh, and so that they can pick, they've got two or three of those and they'll have them with all different carriers because you never know when the service from one is going to be down and the service from the other is up. And so, you know, even in the middle of the jungle, there'll be a teenage boy out there watching music videos <laughs> on YouTube. Um, so yes, they, it's, it's actually rapidly expanding. Um, so yes, that has become a very viable, a very viable tool that, I mean, I don't think any of us really would have expected. Right. But, uh, yes, sir. Excellent question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you for your patience. What do you eat there? What do you eat? Lots and lots of rice. If a Liberian has not had rice, he has not eaten. Uh, so they eat lots of rice, and then they'll eat lots of fish. And uh, they have this plant uh, called cassava. It's actually the yucca, the yucca or yucca plant. Uh, you might recognize it from that. Lots of it in South America. <coughs> And they'll make stuff out of the roots, and they'll boil the leaves and stuff and put those on top of the rice. And uh, between the two of us, I've had experience with this. A cow patty tastes better, looks better, and smells better than a <laughs> 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 so, Yes, yes, ma'am. Is it hot there? It is very hot. It's very hot. Uh, it's, if it gets into the 70s, they're freezing it. They're wearing winter coats, uh, so it's 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 very hot. Yes, sir. Do you, do you like the chicken? Or do you do any feelings? I could not. I I, I, I could I could easily see that happening, but it has not had to happen to me to, to, to me yet. But I will tell you, when I was in a village, and the village was the name of Zikipa, um, I had food with a deer leg. They, because I was a guest of honor, I got the deer, like the deer are tiny. You were telling me my deer, I killed were tiny. At least these deer are <laughs> So there's a tiny deer leg in there, and they didn't cut them up or anything. They just kill it, take a machete, and cut it in pieces, and it all goes in there. So it had the hair on it and everything. Uh, <laughs> all right, next question. <laughs> yes. Mud man. Um, um. They don't have broccoli. They don't have broccoli. I like broccoli, so I miss the broccoli. But there's no broccoli there. Yes, sir. Is it cold during the night? I can't hear you. Cold, cold, cold during the night? No. No. It's, 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 it's pleasant during the night. All right. Yes, sir. So population 3.4 million, right? Is that what it's saying? So at, that, at least. At least. And the size of Tennessee? So how is there any remote areas? <laughs> is it like, I mean, is, I mean, like, is, when you say remote area, well, like, how many people is colonized inside of that remote area? Well, the cities are very, are very, very packed. Okay. Um, so the cities are very packed. Um, and then the, those, those rural areas, it's a little bit more difficult to, it's a little bit more difficult to know, just because of the trap, the travel issues are, you know, you can't, there's, there'll be months out of the year where, you know, you just can't, can't get to certain places. Um, and then I have flown across the, the country diagonally, and you know you just fly over miles and miles and miles of jungle. So how 3.4 million people are hiding out there? I don't know. 
Um, but you'll just see little circles and uh, what you would imagine them having to build, just the circle huts and some smoke and you know, one or two little trails that disappear in the jungle and that's it. So I don't know how 3.4 million people are, are out there, but that supposedly, that's what they said, supposedly they're there. And so second question that then is, is how accepting is the remote tribes? I mean, you might not know the answer to that if you have there. How accepting are they to people coming into their remote areas? That is a case by case basis. I've talked to a lot of nationals about that. Um, one of the major concerns um, outside of the developed areas, you know, African mysticism, but basically we just straight up call it voodoo, uh, is still a very big thing. And then on top of that, there's been a lot of Muslims fleeing from North Africa. And these are what we, what we would call the less extreme Muslims fleeing from the more extreme Muslims. When you're looking at Muslims, it's just a range of uh, you know, non-militant to very militant, and they chase each other around based upon whether you're as violent as they are or not. And they're coming in, and they're fleeing you know, from the north. They're coming in through those undeveloped areas, and a lot of these villages are becoming Muslim because Muslims are coming in, and it's just the first new thing to get to them in a very long time. And so then they become you know, very defensive of that. So uh, they kind of depend on a case-to-case -case basis, but there are, would definitely be places where you would not be safe as a, as a visitor. It's just a, a matter of finding out where it would be. So, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Um, very, very, very poor for most of the country, although there is a, there is a second world level hospital in the capital city, and uh, so there, there is there is a good hospital available for those that can pay for it. Uh, you know, those that are you know centralized to, to that city. Outside of that, not not so much. I, I cut off the tip of my finger here with the machete that's laying on the table in the back um, while I was over there, and uh, it was stitched back together by a UN nurse. He'd been a field nurse during the Civil War. And he was using it, uh, you know, with my permission, of course, to train his medical students. Um, but uh, it was it was a it was a it was a fiasco. I'll just put it that way. Uh, so not 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 that much. But, okay. <laughs> I've not had an answer to question for this fellow. So yes, sir. <laughs> It's not outside the realm of possibility. Now, that once once we're there, we'll we'll talk with Brother Walt, and he'll get together a mission trip, and you come over there, and we'll go see you and the two of us. We'll explore the answer to that to that question. You know, so if we come back, you'll have a great story. All right, there's somebody. One of the, somebody I, I have not. Okay, you in the you in the green shirt. Yes, sir. Is there a lion there? Actually, the Asiatic lion is the is the country's national animal. As for whether they still exist in Liberia or not, I don't know. Most of the animals got killed during the Civil War, and now if it moves, they'll they'll try to kill it and eat it. So if they are there, they're very few. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Is there cheetahs? Uh, no, not in Liberia. Yes, ma'am. Do some people live in huts? A lot of people live in huts. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Does it snow? It does not snow. <laughs> it's too hot for snow. Yes, sir. Okay. Which can you say it one more time? Is the Bible there? Uh, the Bible is there. Uh, there. There's there's Bibles there in English, and if you, they can read English and they can read the Bible, so there is that. And then there are people that are also working on translating it into some of the dialects as well. So, yes, great question. Question number two? Um, what type of drinks do you have there? What type of drinks? Drinks. Well, we have water. Uh, there's, you know, in the capital, in the cities, there's all kinds of different drinks. They're, they're just like American sodas, just different names. And then, you know, there's all kinds of bad drinks and, you know, just... Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, sir. No. 
All right, this is your third question. We only, we only answered three questions. Have like you ever seen a bug? So. I could say, um, um, maybe, maybe if we fight a bite, a four-letter, whatever it's called. Yep, yep. Um, 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 I have eaten bugs, many bugs, just not in um, Liberia. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes, sir. Did you dance? I don't know. I don't know. All right, yes, ma'am, in the back there. All right. Can somebody repeat her question? And they have church there. Yes, there are there are churches. Now, most of them are good churches, but there there are churches. It's a great question. Yes, sir. When you go around to these churches and you're, you're working on getting support for what you're going to do, do you have a particular church that you consider to be your saving church? Yes. Yes. That would be yeah, the church that I, I grew up in, Maranatha Baptist Church. Oh, Shut up. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you for that position. Now, it would be my, I guess we could say it was my wife's Sunday church. <laughs> the way that, that makes you happy. I, 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 don't, I don't know. You know, I would. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. It's not a political statement. All right, so don't make more of it than it is. Would you consider your church a pencil lady to be you? No. No, see, uh, that I didn't even, you know, even the church where I pastored, that's even, that's not my ascending church. My, my ascending, our ascending church is a church that I spent uh, most of my life in growing up. Uh, so I have a very good relationship. It was my home church, you know, before I moved off. So, you know, I know the people there, they know me. Um, it's important to have that history. Um, I have a very good relationship with the pastor there. Uh, that's a very important thing, too. Um, so because of those things, Chose to you know make them my my sending church. North yes, in the North Carolina there where I, where I grew up. So, <coughs> all righty, I'll take one more question from from, from you. Is there a preacher at the church? There are preachers at the churches. Yes, sir. If there's churches, there's generally preachers. You file that one away. Yes, ma'am. What did they play uh, They play soccer with oranges. They play all the games that y'all play. You know, just, you know, they play with sticks like what I used to do. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and they work a lot. They do a lot of farm work, so they don't play that much, but they do play. All right, uh, I don't think I, I don't think we'll hit, I, I, you guys should come by the table afterwards and ask the question. <laughs> See, I'm like a genie in a bottle. You get three wishes. Right? All y'all have already got four, so I've had generous today. Yes, sir. Uh, in your presentation, you said you're going to be using uh, technology like cell phones and do this podcast and things like that. As a goal. As a goal. Yes. Uh, do you have any getting that goal with the problem with electricity things that you have? We, we do have some plans that we're working on right now, um, including a, uh, a website and social media platforms that we will use to couple them together as an evangelistic outreach. Uh, so there is some things that are in the works there. Um, as long as we are able to, you know, provide ourselves with enough of a, uh, we will have enough guarantee of electricity, so on and so forth, that we can be able to, you know, run these things as, as needed. Uh, but that's a great question. Uh, you, 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 I see the, the raising your finger. You're like, you, okay, okay. All right, I was like, he's waiting for me to stop talking. It's, it's what my wife does when I'm, when I'm talking. She just waits for me to Okay, all right, anybody else? Back at the table, buddy. You gotta come back to the table. Which, by the way, y'all are welcome to stop by the table, grab a prayer drawer, grab a brochure, you know, ask us questions, look at the machete that shot my finger off, all that good stuff. Uh, just don't hear anybody with it. Uh, so, Well, we will try to uh, be short. My wife always says, don't tell me to be short because it automatically means you're going to be long. But we're going to try because she said she's got candy and she'll give me candy if I don't go long. So 
Yeah, he said he'd give me three pieces of candy too, so we'll make this short. But uh, anyways, I appreciate the, once again, the opportunity to be able to be here and present our ministry and answer some questions. And if you all would like to talk more about it afterwards, uh, we love to talk about it. So just go ahead and swing by the table. Um, my, my mother-in-law has kept me well fed, so I'm not hungry and I won't bite. And uh, yeah, so... Okay, I was, I was in Liberia my second trip, and we had purchased some equipment in the capital city to take out to uh, the city of Ganta. It's kind of in the middle of the country, and uh, we were going to use that to help build the foundation out there, and that was an experience in and of itself. Uh, they have some very different construction techniques than what we do here, and sometimes a little bit of you know, contention as to which one was the right one to use. But uh, when you buy expensive equipment, you don't just want to give it to somebody and tell them, hey, take it over here. You'll never see that again. So uh, I was the one that was elected to ride in the truck because there was about this much space. And I was the only one that was even possibly going to fit in there. And uh, so I'm riding with these guys for about four and a half hours as we transport this equipment. And of course, they want to know why are you here, who are you, where are you from, all this good stuff. And as I'm telling them who I am and why I'm there and uh, my hopes for the future there, uh, they were just very confused. You know, coming from their context, you know, the average Liberian has, you know, no money from day to day. You know, they make just a little bit doing odd jobs on the street to buy the food for that day. That's it. You know, their dream is to go to America, to make money, make it big, and get out. And here is somebody, a young man from America, that had everything that they could hope and dream for, and he's saying, I'm going to put that aside and come here and live here with you and live like you. And they didn't understand that. They couldn't understand that. And, you know, folks, the, the motive behind that is obviously not to make money. It's not, it's not to be famous. It's not to have cool things in life. Uh, you know, I told the Lord when I was going through, through school, I said, fine, Lord, I, I'll serve you, but I'll be a pastor, so that way I can keep my guns, and I can have my trucks, and I can go fishing on the weekend. And, uh, you know, the Lord told me that's not what he had for me. And they couldn't understand why I would want to come and spend the rest of my life in a place like Liberia. And there's some reasons for that. And uh, we're this evening, we're going to look at God's Word, and I'd like to just briefly show you five reasons from God's Word why we should tell. Now, maybe there's somebody here this evening, and you're like, maybe the Lord's called you uh, to serve Him in some full-time capacity. Maybe you're a young man, you're like, hey, I feel like maybe the Lord is calling me to preach. Or you know, maybe some of the young people that were just in here, you know, maybe someday they'll grow up to be a missionary and take the gospel to some country where it isn't there currently, as it was a possibility. And all of us, whether we're to serve the Lord as a pastor or a preacher, an evangelist or a missionary or anything along those lines or not, we've been called to tell others about the gospel. God has saved us to serve. There's a reason why God didn't rapture you to heaven the moment you accepted Jesus Christ. He left you here to live a life that honors and glorifies Him and points others to the gospel that you've received. And so as we go throughout our lives, whether you've been called to cross the sea, whether you've been called to cross the city, or just called to cross the street and tell somebody about the gospel, there's five reasons we find in God's Word about why we should tell. I'd like to bring you that sermon here this evening. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to briefly look into your Word. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you be with me. Give me a clear train of thought, and I just pray to help me to clearly communicate. Uh, what you've taught, taught me and what you've laid on my heart. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will work and move. Uh, Lord, if, if you don't meet with us this evening, then, then I'm just wasting my breath and wasting these good folks' time. Lord, I pray that you'd encourage us. I pray that you'd inspire us to tell others about the gospel. Lord, in your name we pray these things. Amen. Five reasons from God's Word why, why we must tell others about Jesus. Reason number one is the most obvious from God's Word, the command from the Savior. Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, in verse 19, we see the command from the Savior. You know, Jesus undeniably commands a believer to tell others about the gospel. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Matthew 28, verse 19, we find the very last words of Jesus Christ on this earth as very important as somebody's last words are very important. And here we have the last words of Jesus Christ before he leaves. This is his last message to us. 
And this is what he says, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The gospel was a revolutionary concept. Before Jesus came, the Jewish nation had developed the idea that the gospel, that God was just for them. It wasn't for anybody else. If you were a Gentile, if you were not born a Jew, then you were just automatically excluded. And here Jesus is saying, look, this is for everybody. Praise the Lord. The gospel is not just for the rich, for the famous, you know, the people in the cities, the people in certain countries. It's for everybody. And part of that being for everybody is he says, look, I need you to go and tell everybody. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That word creature literally means every living thing. John chapter 20 and verse 21, then said Jesus unto them, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me, even so send I you. Now we know that God the Father sent his only begotten son to die on the cross of Calvary to reconcile mankind to God, to give us that way of salvation. And he says, just as my father sent me to make it obvious that you can be saved, I'm sending you to do the same thing. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 58, uh, tells us about how Jesus met with his disciples. He tells them, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 picks up that story. The disciples of Jesus, all the believers and followers of Jesus, are assembled there in Jerusalem waiting for that power from on high. And he says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit that was given to each and every one of us as believers, as born-again sons of God, is so that we can tell others about the gospel. We've been commanded to go. Where God has commanded you to go is between you and God. I can't tell you that. Pastor can't tell you that. Uh, nobody can tell you that except you. You know, but as you live for God and as you grow closer to Him, as you seek to serve Him with your life, God will put you in specific places so that you can be a witness where you are at. Right. Jesus' command to us today is still the same. The Great Commission has never been changed. It's never been recalled. It's never been amended. The first reason about why we should tell the gospel, reason number one is the command from the Savior. Reason number two is the cry from beneath. The cry from beneath. Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, we find Jesus giving the story of the rich man uh, and, and the beggar Lazarus. And in this story, there's this rich man and this beggar named Lazarus, and they both die, and then the story picks up with them in their eternal resting places. Uh, we'll pick up at verse 27. Uh, the rich man has died, and he is in, he's in torment. He's in uh, Sheol. He's in hell there, the place of the dead. And Lazarus is in uh, Abraham's bosom, which is, is a place... Uh, where, the, where the saints went before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, after which we are now going to heaven. Uh, it's not a part of this sermon, but that's just an explanation, an explanation about where we find ourselves. Luke 16 and verse 27, in this, this rich man in torment in hell here, he says, I pray thee therefore, Father, speaking to Abraham, that thou would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren. That he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And goes on to, to say that, you know, if they, if they don't listen to the prophets, they're not going to listen to one, even though he claims that he rose from the dead. But the point here, folks, is that this is not a parable. Sure. Jesus spoke in specifics. Jesus often told parables. Those are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. We call them sermon illustrations. Okay, he often gave those. Uh, but this, although he's using it as a sermon illustration, he's naming names. This is a real man who is still today burning in hell, very possibly joined by all five of those brothers whom he was crying out, begging for somebody to go and to tell. You know, we can, we can, we can wax eloquent on this here tonight. We're not going to. Uh, the point of, of all of this is this. 
The damned in hell would gladly preach the gospel if they were given the chance. They know that their fate is sealed. They know that their time is done. But out of genuine compassion for those that they left behind, they would gladly tell the gospel if they could. But folks, their time is up. They no longer have that opportunity. Their time has passed. It remains for us, the living, to tell the gospel while we still have the time. Number one, why do we tell the command from the Savior? Number two, the cry from, from beneath. Number three, the call from without. The call from without. Go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and we'll pick it up in verse 9 there. Acts chapter 16 and verse 9. You know, folks, the lives of the lost around us are crying out for help, for answers, for purpose, for the love of Christ. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that every human being was created to know God, to love God, and to commune with God, to have that fellowship with God. Your purpose as a human being, your purpose as a living soul will never be fulfilled apart from Jesus Christ. I've heard it said, surely you've heard it said this way as well, there is a hole in your soul in the shape of Jesus Christ, and only Christ will ever fill that. You know, we look at the world around us and we see the, uh, the people that are exploring the alternative lifestyles, the people that are exploring these, these funky religions, these people that are following after these cults, these people that are, have been swallowed up by these mainstream denominations. We look at people that are using drugs, they're seeking alcohol, the illicit sex, the extramarital affairs, all of the problems of this world when we look at it and you ask yourself, why are people doing this? It's because they're looking for something to make them feel again. They're looking for something to make them feel fulfilled. Why are they searching for themselves? Because they haven't found themselves. Because they won't see themselves with the picture of Christ. They are looking for what you have. The peace that you have as a child of God. They do not have. Past few years, this idea of mental health has really taken the world by storm, and there is some legitimacy to, to a lot of that. But as we look at the past few years and the spikes in people that are seeking therapy, it's, it's, it's astounding. It makes you wonder if there's a single sane person in the world at all these days. Mm. And it's because people can't cope with life. Yeah. You and I, we have Jesus Christ to help us through hard times. You know, we're, we're, it's, not that, it's not that we're strangers to the rain. It's just that we have some help. And we may not know what comes through tomorrow, but we know the God that holds it. And we know that we're also able to hold His hand. Yeah. Acts chapter 16, verse 9. We find this story. Paul and, and his, his traveling team, they're... They're trying to go a certain way to spread the gospel, but it's just not happening, and they're not sure what's going on. And then in verse 9, the Lord makes it clear to them where, to the, where they're to go. The Bible says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man in Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, and shortly gathered that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. Now, folks, if you go home tonight and have a vision... Uh, don't come back to me and say it was the Lord. I'm going to tell you not to eat pizza before you go to bed. That'll give you visions. Uh, okay, uh, you know. We, but this is a this is an example here. You know, folks, I've not had you know librarians showing up in my dreams saying, "Come on over and help us." And you're probably not going to have anything like that either. But as you walk through the store and you see somebody who clearly needs some help. You, you have a conversation with the people that you love in your life that are looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for fulfillment. They may not come out and say, hey, help us, but it's, their lives are screaming it. You know, our Savior said in many places in the Gospels, the harvest truly is great. You know, John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus says, Say not ye there yet four months, and then come the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Y'all are going to have Farmer Sunday on Sunday. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave so early Sunday morning to get to where we have to be in Tennessee uh, that we will not be able to see all of the trackers. So I got excited there. So I'm like, oh, we'll be here for the Sunday morning service. I'll get to see one of these Farmer Sundays. And no, no it won't happen. 
Uh, but uh, you know, you guys are going to have this day where you celebrate farming, and it's uh, centered around th that cycle of, of growing and raising things from the land, and bring, going out and, and sowing that seed, and, and growing that plant, and then reaping that harvest. And Jesus uses this illustration over and over again to talk about the souls of men. And folks, this call from without is an urgent call because there's only a small window of time when harvest is possible. Sure. Several of the men in my church in Pennsylvania where I pastored for a short time, they were farmers. And they were constantly stressed about the corn because the weather was bad. You didn't want to, you didn't, you didn't want to harvest the corn when it had ice on it and snow and things. And you didn't want to harvest it wet, but you didn't want to leave it out there for too long either. You might as well just cut it all down and till it all back in because you won't be able to use it for anything. And they were always talking about, oh, I hope I can go out I can I can get that in this week. Or I can go get this field cut this week. It was a big deal because they knew that the time of the harvest was limited. You know, James says that our lives are but a vapor. I've done a little bit of camping lately. You know, you light the fire, there's smoke, but there's only smoke for so far, and then it's just gone. Those sparks fly upwards, and they're bright, and they're beautiful, but then they just disappear within a few seconds, and that's our lives. And somewhere in that short time span, that person has to hear about where they're going to go when their spark burns out. Somewhere in that short time span, somebody that cares, somebody that loves them has got to tell them that, there is, that the Son of God died on the cross of Calvary to save them from their sins. Somewhere in that short time span, someone's got to tell them that there's hope and that there's answers and that there's joy in Jesus Christ. You know, the death of the lost is guaranteed. Hebrews 9, 27 says, As it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Death is coming, and folks, we don't know when it when when, when it's going to hit. I lost a brother in a, in a tragic accident, and it, it changed shook my shook my entire world from top to bottom. I had no idea we were going to have that happen that day. My father passed away from brain cancer. I remember getting that that phone call when he was first diagnosed, and I was just like, "You got to be kidding!" You know, just when I felt like I could breathe without crying again, here we go. Thought he was going to pull through, and then just all of a sudden, downhill from there, and he's gone. You know, folks, we don't know when our time is coming, or when their time is Amen. coming. Amen. Not only is the harvest limited because people die, but number two, we have the return of the Lord. Second Peter chapter three, verses nine through ten says, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promises; not lazy; He's not forgetful. As some men count slackness." But as long suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And we say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Jesus is coming again. And that's great. That's right. We should be looking for his coming. But we also need to remember in the back of our minds here that that same coming of Christ... Which we rejoice, it brings our rescue, it brings their damnation. Number one, the command from the Savior. Number two, the cry from beneath. Number three, the call from without. Number four, the constraint from within. The constraint from within. Uh, I'm looking here for the, the passage of Scripture. Uh, to turn to, and I'm not, I'm not seeing it, so I'm just going to keep going here. But the constraint from within. Paul would say that he was constrained by the love of Christ. He say, for the love of Christ constraineth us. It's a big word. What does that word mean? The idea of being bound, being controlled. I remember, here's a, a sermon illustration for you. I remember when I had just gotten into the youth group, and, and all of these teenage guys, you know, I just thought they were awesome. I wanted to be like all of them. I was... I was naive, I was dumb, I was homeschooled, okay, so and we're, on this, we're on this camping trip, and we're all having a great time, and there was a great divide in the youth group, not, not like people against each other, but there was all, a lot of older kids, and then there was a big gap, and there was a lot of younger kids, and okay, I, I was 12, so I was one of the younger kids, and, and I remember being there, and I was, I was sitting in the creek, and I was, I was sharpening my knife, and I was just doing a little, little, little little Boy Scoutish kids do, I guess. And I was just enjoying, enjoying life, having a good time. Here come these bigger guys, and I'm like, oh, the cool kids, you know. So they come over, and they opened, they started this conversation, and I, I just suddenly got the feeling that this was, they were up to no good. You know, you just tell that somebody's up to no good. And next thing you know, I'm duct taped to a tree. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, that, that was a, a core memory for me. I learned many things that day. First of all, not everybody's your friend. <laughs> don't trust people. And, and, and number three, don't be that guy when you know you're the 16 and 17 year old on the on the on the teen campout. So I did try to live live by that last lesson and do one to others thing, uh, maybe a little bit better than they did. But I remember being bound to that tree. I was constrained to that tree by. Two rolls of duct tape. And I, I was a shrimp of a kid. I weighed 80 something pounds. I don't know why. They could have gotten away with, you know, four or five feet of duct tape. Two, two rolls was a bit of overkill. <laughs> and I'm going to have to go confess bitterness at the altar after all. <laughs> not really. The point of that sermon illustration is not just to have a good laugh at myself, but. Paul says, I'm constrained by the love of Christ. He says, I'm bound by the love of Christ. He says, I do what I do. I am who I am. I go where I go. I preach what I preach because of the love of Christ. It is the driving factor in my life. Romans 5 and verse 5 tells us that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given, given to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. That was the verse I was going to have you turn to. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse 11 of that same chapter, he says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. This is the idea uh, that was preached in that famous sermon back in American history. Uh, with sinners in the hands of an angry God. Hebrews chapter 31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But that's exactly what is going to happen to every soul that dies without Jesus Christ. You know, Paul makes it resoundingly clear, folks, that we are to be bound by the love of God within us to tell others about the love that has saved us. Yes. Verse 20 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God to beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. God has saved you to serve him by telling others the message that he has given you to tell. You know, folks, if you've been saved by the love of God and you are right with God this evening, then his love, of, then his love should be filling you. And if his love is filling you, that love will be manifested. It will be shown to everybody around you. And one of the ways that it's going to be shown is that you will love people enough to tell them about the gospel. You know, my, my time is running out here, but let me belabor this point just a little bit. I wasn't planning on it, but maybe I'm supposed to. A lot of folks, they have unsaved family and unsaved friends that they don't tell the gospel to because they say, well, I love that person and I want to keep the peace. Mm-hmm. That's a righteous excuse. But that's all that is. Imagine with me, if you will, me and Nehemiah are out taking a walk. And we're walking down the street. And he strays out into the street just a little bit, like he often does when we go when we have gone on walks. And there's a car coming around the bend. I can hear it. It's moving fast. Y'all drive like you're crazy on the street out here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you know, me and mine probably ought not be out on the road. He don't know any better. He doesn't see the car. He's too busy playing with the bug. I'm like, well, you know, I, he probably ought not be out there. But because he's family, I want to preserve peace. I, I think I'll just, he's, he's, he's a big boy. He can do what he wants. He can make his own decisions. He's an intelligent human being. I don't need to tell him what to do. He can figure this out on his own. Now, when he gets hit by that car, you think his parents are going to buy that story? Yeah. Are you going to buy that story? Yeah. Okay, you, you go to heaven, and we're standing there behind the good Lord, the great white throne judgment, as the, as, as, as the unsaved are paraded before him, and he sentences them one by one to hell. And you see your friend there, and you see your family member there, you lock eyes with them, and you try to tell the good Lord, oh, well, I see, I, uh, you know, he was a, he's his own man. She's a strong, independent woman. She don't need any help. She, she, she knew. I didn't have to tell her. We both grew up in church. 
They, they made their own choice. Now, I know I didn't tell them, but I mean, they heard the same things I did. They lived in America. There's a church on every street corner. Sheesh, how was I supposed to know they'd never heard? You think the Lord's going to buy that story? That brings us to number five, the condemnation on sinners, folks. Oftentimes, we talk about how we've been saved from sin. We talk about how we've been saved from hell, but we kind of lose the lose the terror of what exactly that was. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I, I love to hunt. I love to shoot. I'm not saying I'm good at either one of them. You know, but that idea of sin that we talk about so much is that idea of missing. It literally means to miss the mark. You know, we're all we all have to measure up. God's gonna we're we're gonna have that relationship with God. We have to measure up to that standard of His righteousness and His holiness, and that's something none of us can do. Right. Bible says that the wages of that sin is death. You know, how many of y'all work a job when you're the seed? When y'all work, work, work a job, it's got to be more than that. Okay, all right, that's, that's taking a little, bit, a little bit more sense. A little bit more sense. <laughs> y'all don't work for free. <laughs> the Bible says that the wages, our paycheck for living in sin is death. The separation from God, and then separation from this body physically, eventually. You know, but the Lord said... The, the Bible says that God provided a plan of salvation. The way to sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John chapter 3 and verse 16, the most well-known verse in the Bible in all the world, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that God, God loved us even when we were yet sinners. You know, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ took our sins and nailed them to his cross. Amen. We've been saved from our sins. We've been saved from hell. And folks, God has provided this plan of salvation, but it has to be accepted. John chapter 3 and verse 17. That not very well-known verse after the most famous verse in all the Bible. says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. He was already condemned. But that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Folks, they have to believe on Jesus in order to be saved. Amen. Romans chapter 10. It was in the video. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. We love this verse. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Folks, somebody's got to tell them. It's not just Pastor Walt's job. There are people that you meet on a daily basis, people that you know closely that he won't, he won't have anyone. It's your job to tell them. Y'all know the story of somebody, anybody, and everybody. And everybody let nothing get done because everybody thought somebody else was going to do it. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 11 through 12. This is a powerful verse. Let me read this and then we'll work on closing. The Bible says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, means if you don't deliver them, if you sit back and wait, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? In Leviticus, the Lord talks about the watchman. Every city had a watchman. Somebody had to warn everybody else that there was danger on the horizon. And the Bible says that if the watchman doesn't sound the alarm, the blood of the slain are on his hands. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I've been in a situation where I've had blood on my hands. It is a very memorable situation. 
I don't want any more there. You know, folks, my, my goal this evening is not to is not to awe you with my with my personality. <laughs> It's not to give you a good sermon and like, wow, we enjoyed that sermon. It's not to convince you that I'm a missionary worthy of your support. It's not even to do a favor for my father-in-law. It's, it's simply this, to bring you face to face with what God has said is your responsibility to do. And to give you five reasons to do it. All of us here know folks who don't know Jesus. And I hope you'll be reminded this evening five reasons why you should tell them. First of all, you got the command from the Savior. Number two, you have the cry from beneath. Number three, the call from without. Number four, the constraining love of God from within. And number five, the condemnation on sinners. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It's now our job to tell him about his sacrifice. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity we've had to look at your word this evening. Thank you that you are so crystal clear in all of this. Lord, you would be unjust if you held us to a standard that you have not communicated to us, but you've made it clear. Lord, I pray that you would touch the soul here this evening that knows they need to tell somebody. Lord, I pray that you give them the courage to do it. I pray that you give them the opportunity to do it. Lord, I pray that you'd be working in the heart of that person that they need to tell, that even now your Holy Spirit would be convicting them of their need of Jesus, that you'd be preparing the soil of that heart for the seed of the gospel. Lord, I pray you just help us all to remember that we need to tell others about the gospel. Thank you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. <coughs> would please stand. We're going to sing a few verses here of a song of invitation. We want to give you a chance to respond. 397. You know, one thing that uh, you can go ahead and keep playing this hard, but um, one thing that we heard through the presentation was what they'll be doing on the field. But so often we don't like to be inconvenienced. Uh, we don't like to be out of our routine. We don't like to be put out in Sometimes God wants us to be a little inconvenient to reach somebody else or to get our heart stirred so we can reach somebody else. Are you willing to be a little inconvenient in life? There are eternal souls at stake. And I think that's what Kyle was trying to let us know. We're going to sing a few verses here. God spoke to your heart. Why don't you come and pray? Maybe pray for these names here on these cards. But just pray that God will lead us this week to the people we need to talk to and help us to be receptive to what he's trying to tell us as we say. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided
when Becky said they were ready to ask some questions, she wasn't joking. They were ready to ask some questions. And uh, but I think it was good for them. It's good for them to see stuff like that. And we're going to dismiss here in a word of prayer. And you're going to ask Roger if you mind closing the prayer for you, please. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this another beautiful day, Lord, that you've allowed us to live. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our church. Thank you for our pastor, his family, and our church family, Heavenly Father. Thank you for Elizabeth and Kyle for the preservation of night, Heavenly Father. Helping us to go to Africa, protecting and keeping strong and healthy. And we thought we'd ask you to be a all sick and afflicted in our church and our community. And we thought we'd help them heal their bodies according to thy will, not our will, but your will, Lord. And forgive us and bring us back to the next appointed time. We're asking things in Christ's name. Amen.